uh, volcanic eruption in the Arctic region. This, uh, maybe this image shows us uh, the combined uh, ash dis distribution from uh, Mount Eyjafjallajökull when it erupted in 2010. And you can see uh, how widespread it was. And uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of the magnitude of the, of the erupted area from this volcano, it was uh, 480 billion kilograms. And there of 80% of that was uh, air distributed. So even though we have an eruption, which is not in the uh, Arctic region, the Arctic region can be greatly affected by a volcanic eruption. This is uh, Iceland Air Network, just to give you a little bit of insight into uh, my airline. Our business case is to uh, gather people in Europe, fly them to Keflavík, and then onwards to North America and vice versa. So if the airspace around our uh, airport is contaminated with uh, volcanic gas, it gives us quite a headache, as you can imagine. So we are an airline situated on a volcano ale island with 30 active volcanoes. And uh, we have to have a good relationship with our uh, volcanoes. But as in any or in all relationships, we can uh, have eruptions and we have to be able to deal with them. And for over 30 years at Iceland Air, we have been training, especially our pilots, with dealing with volcanic flights, if we deal with volcanic ash in the air, and stuff like that. And our main focus has been to get the flight safely back on the ground. That's been like, at least until 2010. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a, a depiction, actually a snapshot uh, taken in August, but this is a normal day at noon time, showing the traffic, so you can see that the density of traffic in this area is quite heavy. Uh, that means that if there's an eruption and volcanic ash going into the atmosphere, um, the, um, uh, the aircraft that have to be moved around and have to go about this uh, is quite significant. Then um, what, what happened uh, in Eyjafjallajökull was actually a catalyst. There had been incidents before that happened and also plans had been made, and I'll come back to that later. But the necessity of change was really put forward uh, after the AF Hitler and during the AF Hitler Jokul eruption. What happened there was that basically, um, the, uh, you see here um, volcanic ash charts from the London Bach, as it's called, Volcanic Ash Center, uh, which is co-located with the UK Met Office, and to be uh, and this is one chart from uh, ground up to uh, 20,000 feet. So it shows the light blue area, which is uh, density between 200 micrograms per cubic meter and up to 2,000. So during the first uh, few days, um, the limit that was put was the 200. So you can see that's a much wider area than when you go up to 2,000. It was only after um, almost a week that uh, uh, the limit of the areas that were closed was put up to 2,000, but I'll get back to that. There were, of course, a lot of arguments, a lot of upset people, a lot of upset airline executives that happened, but not everybody was suffering. For example, the Oslo taxi company had a good time. <laughs> and uh, John Cleese took a taxi from uh, Oslo to Brussels, uh, 3,330 pounds. And he was very happy with that. And there were a lot of other taxi rides. And uh, I imagine also a lot of stops. There was a, I've even seen uh, amorous uh, films made about this incident where it forced people to be together and sources like that. So basically, not everything was bad about this. And also one good thing, we got a new system, which we'll get back to later. So. When we visioned the volcanic ash, this is how we saw it. We saw clouds full with ash, and we could try to avoid them. But in 2010, we experienced that uh, 
we can see the ash. It was the fine ash which was invisible to the naked eye. And uh, when dealing with this, we can see that we have uh, looking at for short term and a long term effect. Come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so now let's look at why did things go the way they went. And we can put this into three categories or three elements that are contributing to the events. First, if we take the scientific, which is basically the modeling, the ash distribution, the meteorological information, the fallout from the ash cloud, that was uh, really not uh, defined very clearly. So basically what the London VAC did, which is responsible for this area, uh, according to the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, the London VAC is the only one responsible for this area. So even though there were other informations coming in from other uh, volcanic ash offices, they were not the official information. So they didn't really have a clear line on what to put out there as the safety level. So they put up first this 200 micrograms per cubic meter. So, and also the modeling, the information into the model and everything was under discussion. The second element in this is the engineering. What exactly could the engines withstand? And what was safe for the airplane and the people on board? That was almost non-existent. There were no formal statements from manufacturers and think what was safe for the engines. So basically, you didn't have that element in there to base on and then put into the scientific part. The only thing that actually the air traffic management part, which uh, the air traffic control and associated issues, was actually had a very good plan, both for the North Atlantic and Europe. And uh, those plans were put in place, and they, of course, uh, caused the the closures based on the scientific, which was questionable, and the engineering, which was non-existent. So that's why we had the problem. So now it's a question, where did you go from there? So uh, when we discuss uh, what has changed from the airline perspective, we can say that in, uh, in 2010, the airspace was closed, and we had no options to do anything. Uh, if the air airspace was closed, we couldn't fly. So if you remember the image from earlier when I showed you our network, it was a quite a difficult task for Iceland Air to deal with this as the airspace around Keflavik, our home base, was mainly closed. So in ways to manipulate this, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't fly within the airspace as it was closed, so we had to do some other things, which was uh, we moved our base to Akureyri for a part of time in the northern country, northern part of the country, which was a huge task for us. And then also for some days or weeks, we moved the base all the way to Glasgow, so we could still continue to gather people around Europe and get them to North America. So what has changed now is that uh, the air airspace will not be closed for operation. We learned that. Uh, as Ausker said earlier, that uh, we needed more information, and we have done a lot of research on that, what the engines can withstand, and so forth, and so on, something, some things like that. And the legislation has changed to put it in such a way that uh, the responsibility is now with the, with the airlines to perform a risk assessment on their operation, and they have to submit that risk assessment to the uh, regulators to get approvals to operation within uh, contaminated airspace. So each airline has to perform its own risk assessment, which is based on guidance material from uh, the regulator and from ICAO, and is approved. So if you look at the, the ideas that I mentioned earlier about short term, then we are talking about things like we are on a flight and that flight is affected by volcanic gas. There is some engine problems and some, something is affecting that particular flight. How to deal with that hasn't changed much since 2010. What has changed most significantly is the long-term effects. When we deal with, we have fine ash which gathers in the, within the engines and stuff and starts to build up and reduces the engine life. How are we dealing with that to make sure that that doesn't compromise our flights? And that's where we have relied on more scientific data, more scientific research, and so on. 
So from the air navigation services and the regulatory services, uh, state regulators, what, what has this changed? As pointed out by Willi, the uh, responsibility has been shifted from the regulatory side and the airspace services uh, over to the airlines to make the evaluation, and they can use whatever approved information that they can get. Um, the question might be, well, that means, of course, not that the air navigation services have nothing to do now. Um, volcanic ash will still make a, a disruption in where you can fly, and that will uh, require uh, a slightly different management of the air traffic flows. You might ask, why was it this done long before this happened? Well, some parts of it were, but this is what is called a sort of a low-risk but high-impact occurrence. It doesn't happen often, and it didn't happen so very often before. The reason was that you had the few occurrences in Indonesia and Alaska uh, with serious impact on aircraft. But basically, the jet age started somewhat about 50 years ago. And uh, before that time, we had prop airplanes and uh, propeller-driven uh, piston uh, engines are not as sensitive to volcanic ash as jet engines are. And they were not flying at those levels, uh, those altitudes where the this fine ash stays up a long time. So the impact wasn't really there. So that's maybe one of the reasons, and also that this is a low risk, that means it doesn't happen often, but the impact was severe. So we have to, one of the final messages from the air navigation side is that uh, we need to look at detailed planning for low risk but high impact occurrences, and it has to take into account all the controlling elements. And that was, I'm referring back to what I talked, you have the scientific, the engineering, and the air traffic management side of it, and you have to think of all these elements if you have a coherent plan, to have a coherent plan. So what has changed for the passenger? If we, uh, as we see it now, it's less uh, likely that we will have anything similar to air disruptions to air travel as we had in 2010, as uh, we, have, we know a lot more about volcanic gas, the effects it has, and also uh, we have, there's been a lot of research done and also, one thing that is something to keep in mind is airlines might be affected differently as each airline performs their own risk assessment and has to uh, look at their own operation. They can have different things within their operations which makes them more vulnerable to volcanic gas than others. So that's something that we might see in the future that uh, there can be different reactions between different airlines. But. Uh, with more research and scientific knowledge, there will be less uncertainty, especially on the effects and the ash distribution, and someone who is much more suited to talk about that than me, I'll give the word to Ingvar. Thank you.